hi everybody. Welcome along to a brand new series. Can you believe it? It's White and Jordan on the box. Not only are we filling the airwaves, but some very bright spark decided to put our lovely mugs on the screen as well. You cannot get away from me, Jim White, or the man himself, Mr. Simon Jordan, who is looking gorgeous. You're welcome. How are you? You're I'm, on the telly as I'm, well as the I'm radio. I'm well, Jim. The opportunity to avail myself of more time with you and to be educated <laughs> all the more is something I couldn't miss, and even more so, I might get the opportunity to spend some more time with Trevor Sinclair and hear about things like Man City and Raheem Sterling. Trevor Sinclair is with us as well. He is on the way every day, let me tell you. We'll be bringing you uh, the biggest sports news stories from the UK and beyond, and we'll also get behind the stories, behind the headlines as well, if you like. We will have players, managers, coaches, you name it, they will join us. If they've kicked a ball, they are likely to turn up on this show. And our guest, today he is a true legend, uh, the most capped England player of all time. Peter Shilton will be coming on, giving us his thoughts on the England team, their training schedule and their chances uh, over in Rome, of course, come Saturday night. And speaking of legends... We're not going alone on that front either. Each episode, we'll have a wingman or woman to bring us their own insights and opinion. That responsibility falls very squarely on the shoulders of a man who's made a dozen appearances or more for England, including the 2002 World Cup. Who could this be? It only could mean Trevor Sinclair is with us this afternoon as well. Trevor, good to see you, mate. So, uh, Trevor, you're looking forward to it. You're used to speaking to us in the studio on the 17th floor of the news building when we're on Talk Sport. Now you've made it uh, on, on telly as well. We're doing the right thing, I think. I think so. I think so. I think the social media footage that goes out, I think the um, people that are interested in listening to what we have to say, why not see us as well? Good man. I like that. Uh, we all know how much Simon likes to engage with the radio audience and enrage them at the same time. So Enlighten them. Just for you, Simon, we have brought the audience along for the ride. Now, I love that because uh, the audience have come to us and there they are over there on the screen. It is terrific to see you all this afternoon. We have uh, many of our listeners who are going to be joining us uh, on, on the screen this afternoon. They are the people we affectionately call Simon Squad. We have Natalie in there. Give us a wave, Natalie. We have Jamie, we have Phil, we have Annie, we have Carl, we have Laurie. They are all there. Nick and Tom as well. You are all most welcome. You might regret what you're about to do, but hey-ho, <laughs> let's get on with it. Okay, let's move on. And uh, while it's uh, a, a rest day for the Euros, so many big stories are breaking through, uh, not least in the managerial front, because Trevor, I'll get your thoughts very shortly. Simon, I'll get your thoughts uh, as well. Let's start with who is in Simon at Tottenham Hotspur. The man you said mm -hmm. you thought was right for the job earlier on in the proceedings has got the job himself, and he is formerly of Wolves, Nuno Espirito Santo. What do you think about this one, Simon? He's through the door at Tottenham. Yeah, I mean, we spoke about it a couple of months ago on a different platform, talking about the idea of where Tottenham could go. And you threw a bunch of names at me, and I went, that's the fella. Now, he comes with his own set of baggages, because I don't think he's the easiest guy to work with. I think a lot of football managers in this day and age are a little bit ahead of themselves. And I all think they have a list of expectations and ideals and aspirations that they think are given to get. But I think Tottenham, after going through a lot of media, media scrutiny about who they should have and perhaps going with Antonio Conte, which was never a fix or fit that they were ever going to make, Espirito Santo kind of, kind of falls into the category where Mauricio Pochettino was when he left Southampton. It was Mauricio who? And then when he landed at Tottenham, they went, ah, Mauricio Pochettino. I think Espirito Santo would do the same sort of thing. I think they'll have his challenges with Daniel Levy, and I think they'll have some resistance from certain Tottenham fans, but and I think they'll get, they'll get them going. They went through a whole process, Trevor. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we heard so many names oh. being thrown into the mix, Antonio Conte being one, uh, then Gattuso before him, Fonseca. Now they've got Nuno Espirito Santo. <clears throat> when you're not even second, third, fourth, fifth choice, how is he going to feel, do you think? Yeah, yeah, but how do we know exactly who's been offered the job? We know he's had talks, Daniel Levy's had talks with different managers, but for me, like Simon, I always thought... One of the first managers that come to mind, what, if he was going to be available, would have been Nuno. Jumping I think, the, sta I think the style of play, behave yourself. I think the style of play that he played at Wolves was superb. I think he's, he's got a great style. I think it would suit Tottenham, it would suit the fans. But I think it's been embarrassing for the fans, you know, to have to look at the club, managerless, the, the, the star player wants to leave or supposedly wants to leave, and all of a sudden you can't even get a manager in. So it's been a difficult time for the fans, but I'm sure they'll be happy with him. Listen, if he brings results, they're going to be delighted with him, but I think there's a lot of work to do at Tottenham Hotspur, bringing in players, 
Are you going to let Harry Kane go? Who are you going to bring him in to, to replace him? There's a lot of things to go on at Tottenham. Daniel Levy's got his work cut out. He needs to bring players in to make that club competitive it's not, again. It's not going to be a spirit of Santos gift to decide whether Harry Kane goes though, is it? Harry Kane's no, no, going to go because somebody wants to write a big fat cheque. Mm. And if they don't do that, Daniel Levy's going to be saying, no thanks, you're doing as you're told. You've got three years left on your contract. So Spirito Santo may, just yet, get the benefit of England's best player. So you're saying he's going to get a war chest to spend I'm, that money I'm, if he I'm saying, Trevor, that if he doesn't sell... Harry Kane, which is not a given, no, just because your motley crew at Man City can buy a big fat. <laughs> I've never said I've never said I was <laughs> a fan mean of him going to go there. To but the idea that if he doesn't go there, he keeps Harry Kane. If he does go and they get the money that they want, I would imagine that Daniel, as he has said yep. on a very inauspicious interview with Spurs TV, that he's going to give all the money back. Good. Well, I think so the they fans are. Accept, accept that. Well, they win something with Nuno Espirito Santo. That's the bottom line. I'm not sure Spurs are in a position to compete. I mean, they have to do a lot of work in the transfer market. We obviously need to know what's going on with Harry Kane. But I think when you bring in someone like Nuno, if you look at the players that Nuno took into Wolves, there's a lot of Portuguese players and, and, and quality uh, players that can do a job in the Premier League. Again, unproven, but if he gets it right, if he gets it right on recruitment level, I think Spurs can compete. But at the moment, as it stands, I can't see Spurs competing. Win is, something. Is no. he a winner? Is he, is he well, going to prove himself yeah, well, to be he, a winner he, with Tottenham? He's a winner of sorts, right? Because there's only so many things you can win in a season, right? And if you're going yeah. up against the elite managers, I can't run an argument in a different framework where Ole Gunnar Solskjaer isn't a winner and he's managing Man United and then subsequently say Nuno Espirito Santo is a winner. Depends what winning is for Spurs. If winning is getting into the top four, then maybe, but unlikely. OK, uh, not only that, Tottenham have got their man, but Everton have got their man as well. They announced, controversial or not, that Rafa Benitez is the man. It is a three-year deal. Many Evertonians absolutely up in arms about this one. Simon and I have spoken to many of them, uh, Trevor. They're just not having it. Many are saying, calm yourselves down. He's a man who can win us something as well. Earlier on, uh, I, I got in touch with the Everton owner, Fahad Mashiri, who's travelling at this moment in Europe, but that did not stop him from talking to Simon and myself. And we said to him, Rafa, why Rafa? This was Farhad. Look, I'm the biggest fan, right? And I have reacted in most cases ahead of fans, you know, when there was discontent. I think when there were rallies and, and banners against Martinez, I acted. When I wanted to get David Moyes and there was real protest, I didn't take him. He's a professional, dedicated manager who gives his soul to every club that he's been to. And you need to pick up professionals who are dedicated and give everything to their team. And the man is in love with City of Liverpool, not so much a particular club before he joined us. You know, Trevor, they interviewed a whole bunch of people, but you heard Farhad Mashiri speaking exclusively yeah. to us earlier on Talk Sport. And he's saying, listen, this guy ticked every box. It's as simple as that. He's a winner, he's a proven winner, and he wants to be in the city of Liverpool and win something. So he's been at Liverpool, why not Everton? For me, I don't see the problem. Um, for him going there after being at Liverpool, he's been around the block. Listen, he's a fantastic manager. He's, he's done it. He's wore the T-shirt. But I think the last thing that Mashiri said there, he, loved, he, he doesn't just love Liverpool, he loves this city. And I think that's why the people have mm. to accept him at Everton. Yeah. He's a good manager, he works his socks off. I think the fact that he's kept in Duncan Ferguson in the coaching staff, I think that's key. But listen, this has all been landed on him because Ancelotti dropped, dropped it on him and said, listen, I've been offered the job at Real Madrid, I'm leaving. So they weren't really planning for this. I think for me, he's a good manager. They are in transition and you need someone with a wise head on his shoulders. And I think that Rafa has got that. If he gets a good war chest again to go into the recruitment market, I think he's a manager that can recruit players, even though it's not to Liverpool, to the city of Liverpool and to Everton. Before we move on, are you buying into what Farhad was telling you and me earlier on? Um, yeah, no. I mean, he's been Benitez has been hanging around like the perennial bad smell for the last three months since he's come back from China because he's looking for a gig. I don't think that to suggest that he loves Liverpool is for the birds. He loves Newcastle, he loves Valencia, he loves Napoli, he loves Milan. Well, he that's loves, what you do as a manager. Does. When you well, go into the, yeah, into the area, you well, understand the community, you, you understand the, the city. Well, that doesn't mean you love it, Trevor. You're going, you're waxing lyrical about you? how he does, doesn't West like Ham, 
I love QPR. Of course you do. Okay, when you go fine. to that area, but you, for the you buy of, into for it. For the purpose of recruiting a manager to do a job, yes, he, you know, the idea that he loves Liverpool, I, I, I don't agree he with still you. Lives I, think there. He lo- I think he loves an opportunity for Rafa Benitez. Now, whether he's going to take that opportunity and maximise it for Everton's benefit and not just for the benefit of Rafael Benitez is the big question for me because my problem with him as a former owner is I don't like the way he manages up. Mm. He wants to demand and command ultimate respect from his players, but he doesn't extend that for the people that he works with. Do you think he could have learned, obviously, the Newcastle situation yeah. where he fell out with Mike Ashley and, and that become quite uh, public? Do you think he could learn from that and instead of going public, keep it in, in house? But I think it's a scorpion and a frog, isn't it? You are what you are, <laughs> yeah. you do what you do. And I don't think you can help yourself. If you've fallen out of most of the clubs because you haven't got, you'll be fine as long as things go your way. The moment something doesn't go your way, it worries me for Mashiri, but Mashiri's a big boy with a big yeah. checkbook. If he wants to write these checks out and get these guys in, then he has to reap the whirlwind for it. Sam, so, so I'll tell you, you what, Trevor, talking about writing checks out, we, we shouldn't overlook this. The Glazers come in for so much stick at Manchester United. Transfer news yeah. with United. In comes Jaden Sancho. I mean, they've spent a fortune on him. First off, is he going to be worth it? I think so, yeah. He's, he's young, uh, he's talented, um, he's a creative player. Um, he's done fantastically well to, to forge his career over in Germany. Um, and it, I think the fans will be excited about this one. For me, though, it, it causes a different a knock-on effect, a problem that Manchester United will have going forward. And that's what they do with Mason Greenwood because they, they play in the same position at the moment. So for me, there's problems there for Oli to solve. I'm not See, sure. I Simon had that conversation. So. No, but listen, I, I kind of concur with you. But I had the conversation last week about the, the dynamic of listen, where's Mason Greenwood going to go? And then I got universally piled in by a bunch of no nothing Man United fans <laughs> suggesting that he was a Man United centre forward and that's what he was going to be. And I was. Well, making what about Edison sense. Cavani? Edison Cavani's not signed. Well, another he's not year for the long term, is he? No, Edison Cavani's not. for another season. So what you're saying that Mason Greenwood has a, has a year out while he waits for Edison Cavani well, to retire? To you, then you're arguing their argument, not mine. Yeah. My argument is is that why are you buying Jaden Sancho when you've got a ready made player in that position in Mason yeah. Greenwood mm. but the argument being advanced back to me was what are you talking about Mason Greenwood's a centre forward or he's going to be a centre forward lickety split mm. Do you know what? We should put it to the fans. Jamie uh, is one such Manchester United fan who joins us uh, on the video wall today. Uh, Jamie, Sancho in at Europe Football Club. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that mate? Yeah to be fair I'm, I'm buzzing with it to be fair. Um, I think it'll be a great signing. Um, I think with him not playing for England, it's probably done us a favour with the price because obviously we were, was it over 100 million last year we offered for him? Yeah, yeah. Like that. So I think that's probably done us a favour, but I do think we do need a centre back. I think that's. Okay, I, I mean, I'm interested. Before you, we, we, we leave that, Jamie, what's your thoughts on the Glazers? Because, uh, you know, can anyone really legitimately criticise them in terms of business being done in the market? Not business wise, no, but I don't think. They're good for the club. And we've everyone's had arguments about it, and I know you guys don't <laughs> don't necessarily agree with everything we say. But I don't know. As a fan, I don't like the Glaciers. I want them out. Why? I don't like them at all. Why, Jamie? Out of curiosity. Just, just put us in debt when they first come to the club. I don't think that's the right thing to do when you first come to a club. Going into the uh, into the uh, well, trying to branch off out of the Premier League into their own league, I don't think that's a good thing, and they should have done. I don't think they're, I don't think they're very close to the fans. So is that that interaction? Is it that interaction with the fans that is the biggest gripe for you? Yeah, for me it is. Like when you look at the Leicester owner, yeah, I think he does it spot on. Like you can see when they won the cup, he come down, he was celebrating. You can see how much they love them. So they don't. They don't have that with you. But Jamie, that's a relationship born out of tremendous adversity. 90% of football club chairmen will be told by the fans the best football club chairmen are the ones you never hear from. Now that dynamic changes because you don't like the way someone bought your football club. And I'm not understanding, besides the absolute outrage from Man United fans when I make this observation, they put you in debt, they bought the football club with some of their money and other people's money and serviced it with Man United's cash flow. But what precisely... Has it stopped your club from doing? What is it? I know you haven't won the Premier League, and that's probably yeah, half the yeah, chagrin. Yeah. But yeah. what has it stopped you from buying? What has it stopped Man United from doing? I think Man United fans are just offended for the sake of being offended. <laughs> you could say that, yeah. But no, I, I agree with you. They haven't done anything in the sense like they have brought players. There's nothing. There's no doubt in that they have put money in that sense. But I think as an owner, not for you. That many people that haven't warmed towards them, they've got to be something wrong, surely. 
OK, Jamie, you, well, you'll have Sancho, but you won't have the Glazers. Listen, many, many United fans would probably think similarly. Uh, Trevor, Simon, before we leave this part uh, of the show, what about uh, the government set to bring in legislation to allow players to come in from amber list countries, Simon, to exempt uh, them from quarantine rules and enable them to go off with the clubs and play in pre-season friendlies? In other words... What is the great public going to think about that? Because not for the first time, it seems there's one rule for footballers and another rule for everybody else. Well, football is a special, don't you know? Um, <laughs> look, it's a special, don't you know, there's a new variant out there, senior executive footballer variant. It's not very contagious. Listen, it's nonsense. Everybody has to abide by the same set of circumstances. And if you want to be influencers, because we have to listen to footballers quite a lot, what we should, how we should conduct ourselves, what we should believe in, then they should, in circumstances where they can avoid having to travel, which they can by paying their pre-season friendlies in England, mm. not compound an issue where people are offended they can't do certain things and elite people seem to be able to do it, whether it's in relation to their job or senior executives flying around the world or footballers going to play yeah. pre-season friendlies. Well, that's right. That's right. It seems one rule for one, Trevor. It, it really does. It does, yeah. But I mean, I, I why just... don't they play their pre-season friendlies here? It comes a defence of it. No, it's not, it's not so much, so much a defence. Any business that are bringing uh, economics to this country are, not, are now exempt. So it's not just footballers, Simon. But what I would say is the protocols that are and in place... And there's a play, massive pushback on it, Trev. I, I, I agree massive with that pushback. pushback. But what I'm saying is if they're going to have the protocols where they've got the bubbles, they're having testing all the time, and they're making sure that their players haven't got COVID, the COVID virus, what's the problem? Because it smacks of hypocrisy. It smacks of double well, it standards. Well, doesn't know, because I've just been, got back from Portugal. It was a green country when I, I went there. Yep. It turned into an amber country. Yeah. I had to isolate. But, 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 uh, Trevor, you're comparing apples of oranges. You went on holiday. These people are going somewhere where they, they, they don't have to travel abroad. The economics of going to travel abroad and playing games are for the finances of the football clubs. Not just so, that. Well, it is predominantly because you can pay your pre-season friendlies in England. You know it and I know it. Mm. Right? So the bottom line is, is that football does what football wants to do when football wants to do it. And everyone has to sit down and watch that and say, well, that's acceptable. It's not I don't think it's necessary. Time. It's not just football. No, it's senior the executives. Exactly. And the same resistance and the same question is being posed to the government about the reasons why senior executives shouldn't be able to yeah. do this. We are still in an unprecedented time stretch. We are. Except if you're at UEFA, of course. Uh, exactly. Okay. Exactly. You footballers. Uh, listen, talking about that, let's head to the Euros because England in the Euros quarterfinals, of course, all eyes will be in Rome's uh, Stadio Olimpico uh, this weekend. It's an eight o'clock kickoff, of course, for England against Ukraine. And it is a massive, massive moment for Southgate's England. And they are now tournament favourites. Tournament favourites. Rightly so. Well, I mean, they are, you have to say, Trevor, they've got themselves there, they beat the Germans, and they're there on, on merit. Um, where do you stand on what Southgate has done so far? Are you surprised, Trevor, that England have got to where they have got to? No. Did you think Germany would trip them up the other day? No. Because I've commentated on Germany games, and when they played against Portugal, played well, but I've seen weaknesses in their side, um, and they played against Hungary, and they were awful and I've seen where their weaknesses were. So for me, I expected England to win. A, I predicted a 2-0 win for England. I thought we'd be too strong from all over the pitch. Actually, the, the start of the game, because we did change to a three, which for me was a risk, because changing from a four to a three, lads wouldn't have been like, familiar with positions that they had to take off. But they, they adapted well, and then I thought they took the game to Germany and deserved the win thoroughly. I thought they were great going forward. Defensively, again, we're still not conceded. And when you've got a world-class player like Raheem Sterling, you've always got a chance. OK, Simon, we're, we're, your stance on this is somewhat different. Mm -hmm. Sure, they've been doing well, but it would be a national embarrassment if they don't uh, get to the final? Yeah, in the conversations that I've had, when you look at the draw and you've got a manager that walks around with a four-leaf clover in his hand, because luck seems to come <laughs> on his shoulder every time he draws Everyone it. needs luck. Yeah, but there's luck and there's real luck, isn't there? And he, he was born with a significant amount of luck. You get a 2018 draw that gives you everything you could possibly want. And here you are in a championship being drawn against. If you were, if you were picking out of a hat six teams that were Portuguese, Italian, Spanish... Uh, Belgians, Germans and French, which one would you want to have out of that oh, yeah. comfort form? You take the Germans, right? They got then, lucky with the right side of the And then you've got, you, you got the Ukrainians and the, Dan the Danish, mm -hmm. and you think to yourself, how do you get a draw like that? It opens up to give you a real opportunity. So my attitude was, the opportunity's there. It should be considered an embarrassment, given all the noise that we have to hear about how talented our players are and who they are and what they aren't, that we don't get to a final and have a real crack at winning this. Well, that, listen, talk about national... The lads have done what they've been asked to do. They've won the games. Mm. They've, mm -hmm. they've qualified. Yep. They've won the knockout game against, you know, a rival that in, in yesteryear has given us a lot of heartache yep. and played well. And, but we weren't and, playing them in the yesteryear. We are playing them in the, in the, in the exactly, real time. Exactly. And, and we were the better team. We were Remember, indeed. that group of death, you, you're talking Portugal, they're out. Yep. France, they're yep. out. 
You know, well, it, was all a group all, it was a group of death, wasn't it? All them teams have gone, so it's reputation. Yeah. I think on current form, our yeah. players have delivered and they're in the position they should be. Well, certainly one trainer who has delivered particularly well, it would seem, is Raheem Sterling. Now, he's had his critics, of course. Of course he has. Uh, well, Who we'll get to... Who for? <laughs> well, I haven't <laughs> criticised him. We'll get to that in a second. What would you say to those who say Raheem Sterling going into this tournament it was overrated? Well, people are going to say that because he couldn't get a game for Manchester City for the most part and Phil Foden was keeping him out of the side. But actually, I think it's, it's, it's turned it on its head because he's had plenty of rest. He's come into this tournament fresh. And he's shown everyone what he's all about. And that's about grit, determination, being able to affect the game in the final third, being able to score goals. He's our leading goal scorer. Up until the game against Germany, he was the only one who'd scored goals. So if it wasn't for Raheem Sterling, we wouldn't even be in this competition. So yeah. we, should, we should appreciate him. He's done superbly well. I'm glad he's had the rest. I'm glad Pep took him out of the Manchester City siding and rested him. Not but it was by design. He didn't rest him, he dropped him. He dropped him, yeah, of course he dropped him. But, but, you can't, him then. but you can't say that Phil Foden didn't deserve to be in. But now Phil Foden in a couple of the games has looked a little bit tired. He's played a lot of football. So for me, Raheem Sterling deserves all the credit but he But the gets. question is about context, because what we get is a load of hyperbole about Raheem Sterling. He's a very good player, no doubt about it. When, will when that I have to listen to this world class about player. world class, then it starts to get a little bit irritating because he's a very good international footballer that's done the job that's been put in front of him. Some of the criticism that gets laid at his door isn't right, no. isn't fair and isn't necessary. And if you look at the, the selection process, there wasn't a basis for Raheem Sterling to be selected in the start, starting lineup because he hasn't been performing for his club. But in this tournament, there is now a basis for him being picked game after game because he's proven that his selection was worthy. But on that, what would you... So, it's Sancho... He's been playing brilliantly over in Germany. Hasn't had a kick at it. Hasn't had, because Gareth Southgate and the coaching staff look at him in training. Now, if they don't bring you to training every day, you're not going to play. Right. He's got a great attitude. All the coaches that have coached Raheem Sterling say the same thing, whether it was his under-10s coach all the way through to his current coach. When he has dif disappointing times, he pulls, rolls his sleeves up, gets his head down and works for on it. That and that's very exactly subject, what he's done. On that very subject, people who have known Raheem from a very very early age expect him on the big stage to do well. Uh, none more so than Paul Lawrence, uh, his former school coach, and, and a man who also coached him at Queen's Park Rangers. I think Paul joins us uh, on the show today. Paul, are you with us? Good afternoon. I'm with you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Uh, where do you stand on Raheem? How well do you think he's done for England? I think he's always done well for England. Um, he seems very comfortable playing at Wembley. It's almost like his second home. And he's performed time and time again, both with Manchester City there, as well as with England, over the course of years. Um, I think he had a difficult end to the season, but it, all in all, he, he had a good season. It's only a few players in the world, like um, Ronaldo, Messi, Mbappe, Neymar, that when they lose form, they're going to still play. When you're playing at somewhere like Man City and you've got the riches they got, the kind of players they got in their squad, if you're not bang at it and on top form, you're going to get dropped, even for a game or two. There's been times over the years where Raheem has played every single game where other players have been rotated or dropped. Um, some of the big names that they've got, and he's played in all the positions across the front line, whether it's behind the main striker, on the left, on the right, and other people have been dropped and left out and Raheem has been playing. So for him to miss a few games towards the end of the season and people questioning his ability, that doesn't sound right to me. Trevor, smiling here. So you think he's a big player and he's a big occasion player? He's definitely a big occasion player. I mean, like for somebody to score three goals out of four games playing for England at the Euros, that alone is a massive achievement. I always knew it was going to be difficult against Scotland. They're bound to give us a, a really hard game every single time you play us, whatever the, um, the lineup is. So to know that um, Gareth Southgate, as well as all the England coaches, have got the faith and belief that Raheem will go and perform game after game for England. OK, Paul, let's tip to our way into this. Is he world class? I don't know if I would say he's world class. I probably got a biased point of view. Um, <laughs> All I can do is look at how he's performed over the last how many years, plus the fact that he's won so much trophies, playing for Man City, league titles, FA Cups, league cups. They've done really well in Europe. Also, when you look at all what he's achieved, he's played at how many World Cups and how many Euros. So even though he's a young man at 26, he's still a very experienced young man at 26. So that's why a lot of the squad look up to him and look towards him for guidance and help. Come on, Simon. I, I think Paul is absolutely spot on and he's singing probably from the same hip oh, look, shoot come on. as you. Don't, don't try and pitch me on the other side of the argument. It's inarguable that he's a very good player. Otherwise, he wouldn't be at Manchester City. He wouldn't have played for Liverpool. Yeah. He wouldn't play for England. But when Trevor starts to disappear into the horizon of nonsense about he's a world-class <laughs> player, I have to pull it back. 
because that's not contextually right. He's a very good player and, th and that should be something that we're happy with. But to start to use hyperbole to, tr you know, to direct him into a different stratosphere, I think does neither the boy so is, is or Ma is it Trevor's credibility is Amba any good. Is Mbappe a Trevor, what about your credibility? Yes. So what happened to him in the, in the Euros? He's he had a bad missing. game. No, he's, he's gone missing. He's hardly turned up. He had up. a bad game. They, well, the French had a bad tournament full stop. So, but they're full of world class. Well, they've got a few world class players. Yeah. What, so and there were times in that tournament where France looked outstanding, and there were times when they were miles off it. Exactly. But but that's not, not what's that got to do with the price of cheese? But we, you're saying that Raheem's not world class because he's had a, a bit of a bad. No, time. I'm saying Raheem Sterling, over the body of work that I've seen him do over five or six years, isn't a world class footballer. Over the body of work that I've seen Mbappe do over the last three years is a world-class footballer. I say the same thing with Ronaldo. I say the same thing with Iniesta. So I say the same thing so with if, Messi. If Raheem wins with Raheem. the Euros with England and he still continues this goal he, he score... He will be a very good footballer. Will he not be world-class? No. Okay. Will Raheem start for, for England against Ukraine? Maybe not. He might do. I mean, listen, he's, uh, he's got the uh, amazing ability to recover. You know, some players can play a game and they probably won't be 100% ready in four days. Raheem Sterling can do it time and time again. And that's why, that's why Pep keeps on playing him. That's why um, Liverpool played him all the time. That's why England play him all the time. He's got an amazing a, a way to recover from games. He might not play. I think we're going to be too strong for Ukraine. So I think we, it's an opportunity to rest players. Put in, listen, you're resting players for Grealish. You're resting players yeah. for um, Rashford. You're resting players for Sancho. It's not like you're bringing in second-rate players. So I think it's a good opportunity to rest him. Do you rest you players have... in a quarter-final of a major tournament, Trevor? Why not? You, why not? Yeah. Because if you lose the game, which, which Southgate no, always has I've one just said to you, I've just said to you, the players that are going to come in. Yeah. If, if Gareth's been doing his job right, these lads will be 100% ready and fresh sure. going in to play against a team, isn't, Ukraine, that haven't got the strong... The, as a the player, depth isn't, isn't, isn't it... The, got. When you're at, at this stage in a tournament, which is the business end of a tournament, aren't you playing your best team in order to make sure that you ensure the outcome? Well, it depends on who you're playing against. OK. You put your best team out to win whichever game you're playing. Let it? me jump in here because Paul Lawrence, the good news for you is that you get, you're relieved now of uh, any further involvement with Paul. us. You can see what's kicking off with these two, Paul. <laughs> Paul, I want to thank you for your words on Raheem, and you quite rightly are proud of your boy. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you again. Well Have done. A good evening. Well done. well done, Paul. Well, you two fight it out. Um, let's talk about the opposition on Saturday. Trevor, what are they up against in, in Ukraine? And who would be, say, the three to look for? Well, uh, listen, I, I don't think we're going to have a problem. I've got to be honest. I don't think we'll have a problem with Ukraine. I've, I've seen them play. Um, I don't think they've got pace in behind to trouble us so we can squeeze high. And the three players that I feel will, will, will bring us a... a a little bit of concern. One, we already know Zinchenko plays for Manchester City. He's their talisman. For City, he's a left-back, but for them, he plays in midfield. He's great from set-pieces. He's a technician, and I think he could bring us a few problems. Yeah. Yarmolenko, again, another boy that applies his trade in the Premier League, plays for West Ham. Left-footed right winger. He's cute when he comes in on his left foot. He's a bit of a threat. And uh, Yaramchuk. Again, another player that's impressed me in this Euros, but they haven't got pace. And for me, you know, if you're playing against a team that hasn't got pace, you can squeeze up, you can challenge for the ball, high press. If anything goes over the top, we're favourites because we've got absolute speed merchants at the back and we can get there and then start our attacks again. So Zinchenko, Yarmolenko, uh, Yaremchuk, I mean, Simon, at the end of the day, none of those three, you would think, should end up in the winning side on Saturday night, should they? No, and none of the Scotland side should have ended up on the winning side. But they were damn close in that game. It was a matter of time before he'd have a swipe at Scotland. Well, who have actually nothing no, to do with the debate. He's not having at this a swipe, stage. to be fair, is he? He's saying that they challenged England where yeah. they probably shouldn't have. But I think we just got emotionally attracted to that game and we spent too much energy worrying about the outcome and the actual occasion rather than doing do what's necessary. Trevor, that England playing away, I think personally that England playing away in this game is a benefit to them. Yeah, I, I think, think it gives them an opportunity to let the nation become frenzied, yeah. but to detach themselves from it, go and do a job beat the Ukrainians, not yeah. assume they can beat them, but go and do the job, get it done, however you get it done, get back, and then let the fanaticism come to the fore. And not on, I agree with you, Simon, and not only that, I think the Scotland game could be beneficial. The experience yeah. of not turning up, getting too emotionally attract, attached to that game, and, and not doing the job on the pitch, I think that really helps us, and mm. that could help us going We saw forward. that against Germany, yeah. they were very composed. Yeah. Let's go through the others who are still in the tournament. Spain, yeah, still Spain. a threat. Still a threat, yeah. Uh, Morata, we know him. Um, he's been outstanding. You know, and to think that his, his wife and children were abused outside one of the grounds by uh, the Spanish uh, press or, or, or fans, mm. I, I find that very, very disconcerting. That's but right. Morata, hold up play. 
great. Still a finish. Just got an out, outstanding goal um, against Croatia. And uh, he could cause us problems. Eric Garcia, I've not really seen him play for Manchester City. But he's gone in there uh, alongside uh, Laporte. Looks brilliant. Getting up for uh, uh, set pieces looks really dangerous. And uh, yeah, he, he's filled them boots really well. And he'll be a, a massive asset to uh, Barcelona. And Pedri, one of my favourite players of the tournament. He's 18 years old. He's so composed. And he's actually been a liking to uh, one of your world-class players, Iniesta. So composed, gets on the ball. Um, so, yeah, I'm, them three players could certainly cause us problems. I wonder about the Swiss. I mean, uh, my God, they wrote the headlines the other night. What a of win. Of course they did. What a win they got oh, uh, over the French. What can they do now? Amazing spirit. Was that um, their final? Possibly, but the spirit that they shown was outstanding. Uh, you, you're looking at Xhaka, Granit Xhaka. You know, I can't believe he's turned up like he has. He's died his hair and he's a completely different player. He's inspired. The performance he put in was outstanding. Uh, they've got Sefovic. Seferovic. Easy for you to say. That, yes. Seferovic. Never buy teeth from a <laughs> no. catalogue. <laughs> he's um, a forward. He plays for Benfica. Scored a lot of goals. Yeah. Uh, 20 goals in 34 games. Scored two at the Euros already. He's a threat. And uh, Mbolo. Powerful. Uh, gets on the ball. Clever. Good mm. at interlinking with players. Um, and they're, they're their three main players. For the, the Swiss, Simon, are already in dreamland. They've loved it. That's the way to approach a tournament. Yeah, and I think they were fortunate to catch a, a, a French side that were not so much sleep at the wheel, but very arrogant in the way they set themselves up in various arrogant. games. Well, yeah, because I think they, thought, I, thought they, I think they thought they could roll past the Swiss, and I thought they, think they thought they could roll past the Hungarians. And they turned up for various parts of those games and looked outstanding, ran the teams ragged, then went back into their shells. If you look at behind the scenes... Is that not game management? Well, yes and no, but it's also about making sure the players' minds are concentrated on the obstacles in front of them. If you look at the relationships that are going on there, you've got Benzema at... Olivia Giroud's throat. You've got issues amongst the, the camp full stop. So I think the French sort of... Did it imploded. themselves. Yeah, yeah, imploded, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think that's arrogance. So to go to the Swiss point of view, the, the, the idea that the Swiss have had their final, it, look, if they play as well in that game, because let's, let's be clear, right, the two games that we got to watch on Monday, which was the Croatian and the Spanish, wow. uh, and, and the French and the Swiss, made the cure for insomnia that we watched on Tuesday against England and Germany <laughs> yes. look like it, what it was, a cure for insomnia. <laughs> was that the French and the Swiss? French and the Swiss. <laughs> Thank you, like, Money Penny. That was, was, my, Joey Bar that was my Joey Barton impression of traditional language. <laughs> <laughs> There's a touch of Sean Connery in that like one. That, Let's go to, to Laurie, who's part of uh, the squad, who have joined us this afternoon. Uh, Laurie, where's your head with this uh, at the moment, going into the, the, the business end of the Euros? Um, to be honest, I think it's I think England are looking good now. I think um, need to keep their heads and get through at the final. And I don't know, I think whoever comes out of the Italy and Belgium game, you know, they've got to be the favourites to get there and get up against them. The Spanish have, excuse me, the Spanish have been more impressive than I thought they, they might have been. I thought they were more of a team in transition, but they're, they're doing well and as you said, Pedri's running all over. He's, he's playing well and Marata even scored in the last game. So I think if they can tire themselves out on that side, I think it will help the English even more. As a Scot, I'm assuming you will be cheering England along. Oh, always, always. Uh, my French family didn't really help me out this tournament either, so um, <laughs> I'll need to go a bit further back and find, find some English roots there. <laughs> what, what would you say to the, those Scots who are watching, listening, uh, Laurie, who just couldn't, for the life of them, support England at any time? Um, yeah, he's still around. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, he we, doesn't we, mean that, by the way. No, he doesn't mean, he doesn't that. mean that. But we'll take it at face value. Laurie, thank you for that. Trevor, when you look at it, Belgium, many people's favourites, big yep. tournament. They're going to do it? Not sure. I think they've got a couple of injuries. Um, the, the squad depth's not great, I don't think. And you look at the defensive line, probably past their best. So I think we can get out. If, if we do meet them on the way, I think we can get out them in and be victorious. Because, because they're smooth-looking dudes with uh, beautifully coiffured hair, you took the Italians early on, Simon, in this tournament. I did. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think now? Uh, look, despite the fact they were quite industrious, industrial against Austria and sort of puffed and huffed to get past it, that you can't look at the Italians and not suggest that they're not in with a good chance. Yeah. I look at the Belgians and I thought that their performance against the Portuguese, that I thought they were quite lucky to get past that. 
and there was nothing in that side, despite the great array of talent that was on display, that made me look at it and go, wow, that's the best team in the world with the best manager. Yeah. So I look at it, and th my view, if you're asking me for the Dime Store tour of where I think we're going to go, I think it's going to be in Italy finally, final. That's where I think it will be. England, Italy. That would be all right, wouldn't it? Um, before we get to that stage, your two boys from West Ham, Suchet and Kufal, have Amazing. been magnificent. I saw them at Hamden, of course, uh, playing for the Czech Republic. Uh, superb. And that squad has surprised many, not least the guys maybe scored two, uh, the goal of the tournament, Patrick Sheik. Oh, yeah, he's been brilliant. Four goals already. Um, looked really, really uh, confident. Um, Clinical in the final third, opportunist, everything you want, creative, he has imagination, everything you want, your striker, he's got legs on him. Um, you've got Suchek, obviously you mentioned that, Patrick Sheik. Holesh has been a surprise for me. Centre midfielder, plenty of industry, scores goals, assists goals, acts and jackson, he's everywhere. So the Czech Republic have surprised me, but we shouldn't be surprised because we've seen the impact that the two players that play for West Ham and the quality that they've shown, that they can end, handle the intensity. So it's not a surprise to me that they've their squad, obviously a lot of them from the same team, so they've got that spirit within the camp. Yeah, they'll, they'll be difficult to beat because they're, they're athletes. You know, there's a lot of tall players in there and uh, they won't give anything away for cheap. I mean, it could be argued, Trevor, that none of the nations other than Denmark have got this incredible emotional drive mm. to win it because of what happened to Christian Eriksen. Now, the, the Danes surprising many. Yeah. The many would say they're punching above their weight. Might they just punch their way all the way to the final possibly, and win it? Possibly, possibly. I mean, you know, you look at, you look at the squad. Um, I mean, when you talk about togetherness, what happened to Christian Eriksen? You know, we all witnessed that. That was um, heartbreaking. Thank, thank God oh, he's all right. Amazing. But the spirit in that squad now, you can imagine how, how together they are. Obviously, I've you know I've got a soft spot for them anyway because my old uh, boot boy, Caspers Michael, is in goal for them. You know, and what he's achieved in his career, outstanding. So yeah, I think every, everyone's got a soft spot for for, for, the, for the Danish side, and they've got Dolberg in there, 23. He plays for Nice. He's got two goals already. He's a powerful player. Uh, obviously, Andreas Christensen. Champions League winner with Chelsea. A lot of people said he was a little bit flaky, a little bit, mm. you know, milky, didn't yeah. fancy. Not he's, this. he's turning up. Yeah. Turned up at the end of the season for Chelsea. He's playing really well. And, and Martin Braithwaite got his goal, Barcelona player. I think for me, that they, they look a strong, a strong outside bet. Very, very good team spirit. They'd be popular winners if they could do it, Simon, with many it's around the, the world. It's not the first time either. It wouldn't be the first time. No, of course. Yeah. no, of course. I mean, I'm not sure how popular they'd be in England if we played them in semi-finals. <laughs> but listen, you know, because of the tragedy surrounding Christian Eriksen and all that went with that, and the courage that it took them to galvanise themselves. I know they lost the game against the finish, but they went on and got themselves together. Yeah. And they're playing good football as well. But... If it is England against Denmark in a semi-final at Wembley with 65,000 fans, come with the hour, come with the men. And I think it will just be too much for the Danish. I think you'll have an England side with so much momentum if they come through the Ukrainian, Ukrainian game with the home support behind them. You know, with the best win in the world, we all want the best for teams that suffer adversity, but not at the expense of England. <laughs> Trevor, thank you very much indeed, mate. Uh, a pleasure to see you uh, joining Simon and myself uh, today. We love this man on the radio, do we not, Simon? He pushes you all the oh, way, which we like. More than life itself. <laughs> he pushes you all the way, and we love that. Trevor, we will see you very soon. And thanks for joining uh, Jim and Simon on uh, TV this afternoon. When we come back, there'll be a different man in that seat, uh, in the, the Trevor Sinclair hot seat, and it's a man that many England fans all around the world will instantaneously recognise. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jim White. Uh, this is White and Jordan on the box. And we like the sounds of that. And uh, let's get straight into the next part. Incredibly, our next guest played uh, his first international match half a century ago. Can you believe it? That was against East Germany. Remember them? At Wembley in 1970. He went on to earn 125 caps in what was a glittering career. It can only mean one man, and I'm talking about goalkeeper, many people's favourite goalkeeper of all time, Peter Shilton, 125 caps. Mr Shilton, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Jim. Yeah, nice to be here on uh, such an exciting show. Uh, it's great having you, mate. We never thought, well, we, we were confident that we were going well on the radio, but now it's gone to another, it's gone to another stage. I'm, it's deservedly say, so. And deservedly <laughs> so. Heard, yeah. And we deserve to have top guests, and we have one. How much are you enjoying England and what they're doing in the Euros? Oh, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, slow start, really. A couple of performances which everybody thought, oh, you know, we, we didn't perform as well as we should have done, and Harry Kane was getting a little bit of stick, but then it all changed, didn't it? We, we beat the... 
dreaded Germans. It's their first result, really, since 66. And we've beaten them, obviously, in friendlies, but not in competitive matches. And it was, it was a great, it was brilliant. And yeah. I thought we deserved it. That was the big thing. I thought we deserved it. And right from Pickford, right the way through to Harry Kane, everybody did their job. And, um, yeah, it was a great night for the fans. How are they, if anybody knows tournament football, it's you, Peter. How are England's players, and many of them are so young, how are they coping with the expectation on their shoulders? Because now the groundswell of a nation is behind them. Mm. Uh, where are they at with that? Where were you at when, when you had to cope with that kind of thing? Yeah, well, in, um, you know, in a couple of tournaments, World Cup tournaments, we, we started slowly and then we progressed and progressed and ended up getting to the semi-final in 1990. Um, so, yeah, you know, a lot of them are still quite young, which is Gareth, I think, trying to build that squad, you know, the World Cup's, what, 18 months away, the next World Cup. Um, but he's got a, you know, a fair amount of uh, experience in there. But I think, you know, they could go out two ways. You know, they, they could let the occasion as the tournament goes on get to them or their youth can just, they couldn't, you know, they, they won't affect them. So the performances hopefully will just keep getting better and better. I, I think they're showing that, Simon. The, these lads in, in, in Gareth's squad. Yeah. I mean, nobody is overawed by what's going on around them. No. I mean, ultimately, they played in a, in a group that they should have qualified through, so they've done that. They've overcome the Germans, so they're starting to build momentum. What they look is composed. In the game against Germany, they weren't, they weren't exciting. They were just composed and controlled, and they managed the game. I didn't think it was the most effervescent of performances, Peter, but no. I thought it was a job done, and that was all that was required of them. Yeah, I mean... The, to be fair, the Germans missed a couple of two or three good chances. Yes. You know, I Which mean, you'd always Pickford, back the Germans to score, right? Yeah, and Pickford, uh, yeah, especially Muller's one. That mm. was the turning point yeah, for me. Right. Mm. But, you know, Jordan Pickford's made four terrific saves in, in the games, which, Habit, you yeah. know, could have gone in, and he, he made terrific saves. So that, that was very important. Um, but, you, you know, I just think that the way Gareth, the things he's saying before a game, you know, he's, he's coming out, he's saying, like, this is our time. And, and even Harry Maguire was saying, well, you know, the past the past. We want to make our own history. It all seems very, you know, uh, well, composed. Be, yeah. yeah, and I think it's showing that way. They, I think they've learnt as well over, you know, the, they've had a few tournaments in the past and I think, you know, that experience is, is hopefully standing them in good stead. But listen, the game against Ukraine is a difficult one, yeah. I think, because, you know, they've had a great win against Germany. Everybody's up now. We're going to beat Ukraine, not a problem. But there's no easy matches. And Ukraine are the underdogs. And we're going to go to Rome. You know, it's going to be hot. You know, and I think we're away from Wembley. And I think all the expectations on England. And these are the games that really you've got to Slip be up, up for. Yeah. Poland. Yeah, well, yeah, Poland. Right. We had a few. Yeah. yeah. Had some great moments against Poland, but we, we had a, we've had a couple of dodgy ones as well. But is it that different for England uh, for this occasion? to go to Rome, somewhere different. It's not Wembley, it's Rome, OK. Is it going to be that different for them, Peter? It's going to be a change, though, it. isn't it? Because they're acclimatised to Wembley. And, and that, you know, the, the heat in particular, you've got to, you know, go to a different hotel, a different atmosphere. Listen, it shouldn't affect us. It shouldn't. I'm just looking at things that could happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, think, I think Ukraine... I looked at the results. They haven't done too badly against us. They haven't conceded that many goals. They beat us 1-0 in Ukraine not so long back. Um, and they're, they're no mugs. Yeah. And we've got to... It's our performance now. That's we've right. got to... It's, it's how we perform and how the young players perform after having the high against Germany. You played under one of the very best, Bobby Robson. Of course you did. I mean, the, the, the guy was phenomenal. I always used to love being in his company. Now... Simon has his take on Gareth Southgate. Everyone's got their take on how Southgate plays and how he sets out his team. Where do you stand in Gareth Southgate? Having played under the best, you play for Cluffy at Forest, for goodness sake. Where yeah. is Gareth in all of this? I've got to be honest, I think, you know, I wasn't too happy when Gareth got the job because, you know, he hadn't really done a, a job at Middlesbrough. You know, it was his first job. He sort of went with the under-21s and, and got in that way. Um, but... I, but you know, I think he's grown into the job. You know, I think he's set out some real standards in the job. You know, he's, he's put his foot down when he's had to. There's been a couple of, you know, disciplined things and he's dealt with them really well. You know, he's dealt with them calmly. I think he's set standards with the squad. He seems to be 
saying the right things. He's doing it his way, which is always great to see from a manager. You don't want mm. to see a manager being influenced. I mean, to me, I would play Grealish straight the way, you know, because he's, he offers something different. And I think there's so many fans out there that think the same way. You know, he's the sort of player that can attract the ball. He can go past somebody. He can, there's two players coming into him and then he'll play a pass. And he's opening things up. I mean... He so was, maybe not a, adventurous enough. Yeah, but Gareth, Gareth has... You know, he's seen it a different way at the moment. You know, he's bringing him on with it, 25 minutes to go. And it's working for go. England. It's working for Gareth yeah, and it's working it for the, England. The $64 million question will be is when adversity comes knocking, they haven't gone behind. OK, so when they go behind, we need to know, unlike in the World Cup of 2018, where he didn't change anything, he didn't have a second... He was a one-trick pony with what we had on the pitch. The Croatians in the first half in the World Cup were poor, we were good. They changed in the second half, we didn't change, and all of a sudden the game was away from us. Yeah. Now, in this tournament, irrespective of the opposition, someone is going to do something to us that creates a reaction, and then we will see if Gareth Southgate can manage his way through that situation. That will determine whether we get a chance to win this tournament or not. Have you warmed to Southgate in this tournament, yeah, Simon? But, be honest but, with us but here. But you're assuming that I haven't warmed him in the first place. Peter R and I are in the same space. There was no credentials that tells you that this guy gets an England manager's job that A, Brian Clough should have got once upon a time, B, Bobby Robson did get, C, Alf Ramsey had. These were elite football managers. Brian, uh, you know, uh, Gareth Southgate's credentials were to relegate Middlesbrough and to be in the under-21s. Yeah. And then it was no surprise that young players came through because that was his thinking, 21 players coming in. But he's been a, been a breath of fresh air because he's brought the media closer to the, to the team yeah. and he's taken away the expectation and he will know because he played in the 82, 86 and 90 teams that had the media piling into the England managers, yeah. oh. giving them brickbats and South That's Africa unbelievable. Listen, before I mean, we move on, would Cluffy approve of Gareth and his methods? Well, I don't know. You have to, <laughs> Clough is no longer here. Him, but, but I think he Cluffy had his own standard. Would he, but the, would he the, basics, the, the, the basics were, you know, discipline-wise, you know, he was in charge, you know, what he said goes, um, but he got the best out of it. He made players feel relaxed. Now, that's what a great manager does. You know, he, he creates a happy environment, but the players are also tuned in and want to win. And I think you, you do see with the England teams, they all want to win. And I agree with Simon, you know, I mean, the last World Cup, you know, everything went for us, didn't it? Every Everything with the drawer opened Absolutely. up, you know, we won, a, we won a penalty shootout, yeah. which we, we've never normally done. So it all went for us, and then, then we blew it a bit in the semi-final. Um, and obviously, since then, you know, we've, we've, we've beaten mediocre teams. But I think this result against Germany really opened her eyes. But I think he, he's preparing the team well. I think they're relaxed, you know, they're having a bit of fun off of it, but they're focused. And I think, you know, the big test, if we get beat by Ukraine, the knives will be out. Indeed. But I think, I think at the moment he's doing a good job. Yeah. Um, I, I'm interested, just before we leave it, Pickford, the only man for the job, the number one, and rightly so the number one. Yeah, I've always stuck by him because I think, you know, he's, he, I don't know what happens at Everton, but being England's goalkeeper, you know, it's it's a, a burden you, you share week in, week out. Because if you make a mistake, forget the saves, that's going to be played and replayed on TV. And he had a, definitely a spell when he made a few errors, mm. which you think he shouldn't be making those errors. But for England, he seems a di different kettle of fish. He seems up for it. I just like, he's, he's developed what I call you know, taking charge of his defence, working with his defence. You can see that side of him. You know, he's, he's given a few rollickings, yeah, but he's that. also putting his arms round, you know, he's communicating with his defence. And that's that's what a goalkeeper should mm -hmm. do. Mm. You know, But he's also remaining calm himself. And I think, you know, you can get too overexcited and then you lose your concentration. So hopefully he's got that balance right. Um, you know, um, I think well, so far so good, Peter. What, what I do know is we we have a bunch of people who I'm delighted to say are, are very happy to come to come to air with White and Jordan on the box. You're going to enjoy this. We'll have a bit of fun with them. Uh, we 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 look forward to this moment because this is what we affectionately called Simon's Squad, a <laughs> squad of people who, for some reason best known to themselves, want to come to air and join us this afternoon with uh, their own questions for Simon and for Peter, of course, as well because uh, we're talking all things Euros and we're talking all things football. Nick, why don't we kick off with you, my friend? You're a Liverpool fan, I believe. What do you want to ask us, Nick? Uh, I've got a question for Mr Shilton. Uh, based country and club level, who would be in your all-time five aside team that you have played with? 
It could be six aside if you include yourself as the goalkeeper. It's <laughs> a good one. Well, that's a good one. Yeah, very good. I played with a few players in my time, but um, oh, let me think. I, I think uh, Bobby Moore would be definitely, you know, in that squad. Yep. Um, I think Gary Lineker. I think Gary was, you know, you wouldn't say Gary was a great player. He was just a great finisher. You yeah. know, he just had an instinct for scoring, and that's what you expect from a striker. Um, I would say Gaza, um, if you turn up on time or whatever. <laughs> Great name. But, but he, uh, you know, he could do things that um, no other player could. He could go past people, he could score. You know, he just had to keep him right mentally off the pitch. That was Gaza. But ability-wise, yeah, so that's, uh, that's three. Um, let me think. Uh, Bobby Moore, Lineker, Gaza. Yeah, I would say um, Little Alan Ball. Years ago, for the six, nice six, one. he would nice be the one. he would be the engine room. He yeah. he, he wouldn't stop. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to leave somebody out. You know that that people are going to say, but um, let me think. I think a fit Brian Robson. Yeah. Although Brian was a bit injury prone in the big tournaments, but a fit Brian Robson. Natalie, you're coming in with a question for Simon. My question is. Who is the most influential player you've ever worked with? Uh, most influential player? Depends upon your perspective. If it was on my catering department, it would have been Neil Ruddock. Um, <laughs> if it was um, for the achievements in the team, probably Andy Johnson, because he was an England player that scored a lot of goals that took us into the Premier League. He scored a lot of goals in the Premier League. So probably for me, the question would be better served as saying who was the most influential manager because those are the people that I was really focused on because it was the players, it was their job to get the best from the players. So probably from a managerial point of view, Neil Warnock because he just brought a spirit of collectiveness. There were many people that don't enjoy working with Neil. I wasn't one of those. I thought he was a brilliant manager to work with uh, and he was very inclusive and he a brand of football that I enjoyed and as an owner you get to sit there a lot of the time watching turgid tosh that you don't enjoy and with Neil Warnock I enjoyed a lot of it so those are the answers for you. Nice one Natalie good question we like that. Peter the most influential player that you've ever played alongside with who, 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 who would you say is the guy who conducted the orchestra the guy you could always rely on the guy that you always knew would be a 10 out of 10? Um well, listen, I, I played with a great team at Nottingham Forest and everyone was a, a, great, a great player, but, uh, you know, it was a great team as well. That was a big thing. But at the end of the day, I, I always say Bobby Moore was of something special because Bobby, he, he had the aura as, of a statesman, but he was also one of the boys, you know. He, he, he could, he'd like a beer and that sort of thing. And he could read, he could read... You know, but in those days, he had a great habit of actually passing it to one of our own team when, <laughs> when centre-halves used to lump it a little Lumped bit. It. And, yeah, from a stature point of view, you know, I think, I think uh, Bobby, Bobby Moore. Moore, yeah, years ago. I would have loved to have met him, Bobby Moore. Oh, absolutely. And I'd, I mean, I'd like to ask him questions about Brian Clough because, obviously, I had Trevor Francis as my manager. I could ask you if Trevor was as tight then as he is now, but I'll <laughs> ask you about what Cluffy was like because I got to hear a lot of stories from Trevor about how he spoke to players, what the centre forward's job, what your job was a yeah. goalkeeper to keep the ball out of the back, mm. of, back of the bloody net. What was Cluffy like when he came into the dressing room or, or you dealt with him on a day to day basis? Um, yeah, he, he's, he knew people, he knew yeah. how to handle people. You know, I mean, Trevor, Trevor was a terrific player. You know, he, he was the first one million pound yeah. player. Um, and, and when he came, they actually played him on the right wing for, for a while. He scored in that final, didn't he? Because we, we did have a couple of decent forwards. And they John felt Robinson. He, yeah, and he paid off because obviously he scored the goal in the European, European Cup final Cup, yeah. against Malmo, Malmo, coming in from the, the far it. post. From a Robinson cross. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, he just... He, he had uh, one story with Trevor. Trevor was always very meticulous, as you probably know. He is immaculate. And, and we used to have, you know, old towels and, and soap, which, you know, Trevor wasn't, the, wasn't yeah. the best. So, you know, but that was part and parcel of keeping your feet on the floor. I mean, Cluffy would treat the, you know, the, the tea ladies the same as he treats one of his star yeah. players. That was the, the atmosphere within the club. And Trevor came, and the second day, Trevor turned up with his own towel and his own soap. So you can imagine <laughs> what Cluffy's reaction to that was, you know. That's the kind of thing you would do. <laughs> yes, indeed, it probably is, yes. <laughs> uh, let's move on to Carl. Carl, you're, you're, you're uh, on with a question. What do you want to ask? I think you're another Leicester fan, are you not? I am a Leicester fan, yes. Yeah, how are you doing? All right. I'm good, mate. Good to have you on. 
good. And um, just how can we ensure there are facilities available at grassroots level to ensure we still get late developers come through the system and not rely on just the elite academy systems? I think that's probably a question for me, isn't it? Um, look, the reality of it is, is that how we can ensure is get proper funding. The Premier League is supposed to be kicking down 5% of the TV money, which is probably about 2 billion over the last 20 years they haven't done it. Mm. And the reasons why the facilities in this country, if you go to every country around Europe, and Peter will know this, the facilities in Germany and other countries are far greater than the facilities that we have here, which, by the way, is a national scandal because we've got the most powerful, the most financially adept league in European, if not world football. So it starts with the principle of our FA being a damn sight more effective. It then starts with the obligation of the Premier League poning up the money that they should be poning up. And then it starts with people doing things properly and ensuring that the value of our national game reaches all levels, whether it's elite levels, whether it's secondary to elite levels, or whether it's just people that want to enjoy football in this country. Because you can't on one hand say the national game is so important to everybody, and on the other hand, have facilities that are just not in keeping with that. No, exactly, exactly. Having said that, I mean, you know, I, I go back a long way and when, when I was a boy, you know, we used to play on all sorts of pitches. I mean, they, you, they, you wouldn't even play on them these days. I used to go out and practice in, in just in mud. I used to train in the snow. And, and to be fair, you know, I used to think, well, if I train in the snow, you know, it, I might play in the snow one day and I might have to use a different tactic. I'm in the tactic. same camp, mate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so sometimes you can, if you, if you really want to uh, be successful, all you've got to do is practice, 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 no matter whether it's muddy or whatever. You know, you don't have to have a great pitch. You don't have to have a... But you when know, you're you comparing just need... and contrasting about development, I, yeah. when I sat there as a, as a former owner being told that I had to build a 60 by 40 indoor surface for inclement weather. When I asked what inclement weather was, yeah. it's rain. I said, well, it rains 300 days a year in this country, so yeah. I've got to build a 60 <laughs> by 40 indoor surface just yeah. for that. Yeah. But that is the world we're in now. Uh, Phil, you're with us. What do you, what do you want to ask? Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Jim. Uh, I suppose my question to Siren is, do you think Leicester City have replaced Spurs and Arsenal in the so-called Big Six? There you go. Well, the so-called Big Six, as Peter will probably appreciate, is self-anointed. It's not something that, they, that they've got through merit anymore. If you're talking about economically, probably not, because if you look at the revenue generation of Tottenham Hotspur with a stadium that can take 60, 70,000 people, uh, and the same with Arsenal, then probably not. If you're talking about from an achievement point of view, currently, Yes, if you're talking about livery and history and heritage, it's very difficult to argue, irrespective of a 2015-16 achievement that Leicester had, that they sit in the same echelons as Tottenham and Arsenal. But on yeah. form and on performance over the last half a decade, then you have to say, Peter, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I'm very close. I'm obviously yeah. born and bred in Leicester and I'm very close to the club now. And, you know, I've been going to matches, as I do, you know, my all my clubs, but Leicester in particular, and the it's the way the clubs run. Yeah, you know, right from the top. I mean, the, you know, the, the the old chairman unfortunately got got killed, mm. but it's, it's it's carried on the same. And and they they respect the community first of all, the town. You know, they they give money to uh, hospitals. Yeah, I know the they town. they look after the fans. I think they they give them a beer and a pie at, at Christmas. Everyone that comes in the stadium, so they respect. Other side of football, yep. which a lot of clubs don't. You know, we took someone just mentioned earlier about you know yeah. they just they just like stood back the owners. They don't get involved, and and from there that filters right down to the, the playing standard. stuff. Mm -hmm. And also they've got a philosophy of of looking for talent. They they don't mind paying a little bit by good but, talent, but people who are going to get better like Maguire, seventeen yeah. million sold for eighty million. Mares, 500,000, 60 water. million. Chilwell, come through the academy. They'll sell Drink players for the example. right price. Yeah. And but they'll Kenti. also, yeah, they'll probably, sure. they'll probably pay 25 million for a decent striker. Yeah. So it's about judgment. Exactly. You know? I think, Phil, the questioner is an Arsenal fan. So you've got a vested interest in that question, Phil, have you? Yeah, it's just interesting with the Super League and how, you know, it's embarrassing really from an Arsenal viewpoint that yeah. we kind of considered ourselves in that, especially with the run of form. We're moving from Highbury to Emirates to ensure that we competed. Have we competed in that in the but last that's a different five argument, or six though. years? But that's Probably a different not. argument. You see, you've got to appreciate whether we like it or not. The brands that drive the Premier League on the eyes and the prize around the world are Arsenal, Liverpool, Man United, Man City, Tottenham and Chelsea. They are the brands that drive the revenue streams that make a European Super League stand up. Whether you like the reality of a non-merit-based tournament or whether you like the self-interest, it is yeah. those six clubs 
that drive the revenue streams. Yeah. It doesn't make everyone else a poor relation, <laughs> but it is those six clubs, even though this thing And, and, and I thought Arsenal poor. would have come to the bottom of that every year, though, be just, you know, they're not, not beating the top four in the Premier League. So I'd, I'd imagine we'll be at the bottom of that every year going forward. So. OK, Phil, Speaking listen, thanks. Thank you so much for your question, mate. A final one now, and it's coming our way from Annie. Annie, hi to you. Yeah, why do you think the speed of England's forward play has been so inconsistent in the Euros? The, sorry? The speed of England's forward speed. play. Speed, right. Uh, well, I think a lot of people are looking at Harry Kane and he doesn't seem, until he, until he scored the other night, and he, he was the fastest he'd moved yeah. going to that corner flag. But uh, Harry's a great, great player. But, you know, even great players have, you know, have... Spells where they feel a bit jaded. He's got a possible move coming up. I don't. I don't know if that's anything. But he hasn't looked as sharp. I think the first half against the Czechs, he came out. He'd have a bit of criticism, and he was putting his body in the way. He was. He was moving around, and he looked like the the old Harry Kane we know. Um, but I think you know he will. He's he's a proven goal scorer and he'll he'll probably end up scoring a couple uh, hopefully against Ukraine. What about our wide players, Pete? Do our think, wide players. Do you think they've beat? Do you think our wide players beat enough players? Yeah. Well, I think I think it's not just about speed. It's you know it's about guile yeah, sometimes. Absolutely. You know, I, I mean I was talking about Grealish. You know, yeah. mm. he he's, he he slows it down sometimes and then he'll do a little shimmy and he'll yeah. be past them. You know, it's not always about pace. But you know, Sterling, you know, he's looked. He obviously, you know, he's a quality player. He has got pace. You do need pace for balls over the top, you know. Is he world class? But <laughs> is he world class? <laughs> Honest answer. Don't get drawn into uh, this. I, I, no, I, I, you know, I think he's, he's, it's, I don't think he's world class. No, I, I just good think lad. he's. I think he's a he's a good player. You know, we cannot let you go without. And Annie, thank you for that. Without us asking you, Mexico eighty six. Mm. You've forgiven Maradona. Well, he, he died recently, so I suppose, yeah, I mean, I was very sad about that because nobody likes to see somebody die at the age of 60, uh, you know, even though, you know, um, everybody knows what happened in, in, in 86. And the, the reason that probably I've, I would never forgive him is the fact that it wasn't so much that he put it in with his hand, you know, because as a goalkeeper... You know, I knew I was getting the ball because that's why he put it in with his hand. You know, he knew as well. Uh, and I blame the referee and linesman, you know, because... But with Maradona, you know, it was after the match. He never really apologised and he never really admitted to it until a few years later. And I just think a great player would do that. And it is something that lives on, you know, in, in the memory for all the wrong reasons. Um, I did what I could. Um, the alternative set coming off your line, which... I thought it was a great judgment, to be fair. I'm saying it myself. <laughs> uh, was uh, I could have stayed on my line and you've yeah. got the world's greatest player Bring 12 yards chest. out with an open goal. Yeah. So instinct told me I could get there and uh, you still get people saying, how can a little fella out jump you? But he didn't. I mean, he, he put it in with his hand and a friend of mine said, if you chop your, his left arm off, uh, you know, you can see quite clearly that you're getting the ball. It's, it's an incident that will live on, but is is what he did in football. Some of the games I watched of his ability was, was incredible. Yeah. yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Peter Shilton, thank you so much. Let me thank uh, the members of uh, Simon's squad who asked some very good questions uh, on our show today. And that's Nick, Natalie, uh, Carl, thanks to you, Phil, Annie and Jamie. Well done, all of you. Thank you so much. Mr. Jordan enjoyed chatting with you. So did I. That's it. It's all we have time for today. Peter Shilton, I want to thank you so much. Uh, and of course, the man who was with us and has gone uh, for the time being, he'll be with us on TalkSport very soon again. Uh, today's wingman, of course, I'm talking about Trevor Sinclair. Uh, Mr. Jordan, will I be seeing you uh, this time tomorrow? I'll be seeing you, obviously, when Get we go out. to air 10 a.m. Yes. on TalkSport. You will indeed. Yeah. You enjoy it? You enjoy being on the box with us? Oh, more than you can ever imagine. <laughs> OK. Simon, terrific. Thank you for that. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching. In the meantime, from Simon, myself and Peter Shilton, the one and only. Goodbye. <laughs>